Yeah. All right, Dr. Gilbert, uh, thanks so much for stopping by and uh, joining me to chat about your research. Do you want to do you want to talk about where, where you're at right now and uh, or or institutionally where you are and uh, what you're working on? Sure. Uh, so I just started a postdoctoral fellowship position at uh, Penn State in uh, September. Mm -hmm. um, this this past September, um, just finished my PhD um, a, a, a few months uh, before that last year, mm -hmm. uh, and I have a. Um, so I have a USDA um, fellowship here. So I'm, I have a project that has an, an applied element to, in addition to the basic research I'm interested in. Cool, yeah, do you wanna, do you wanna talk about, um, do you wanna talk about Nepenthes a little bit and, and what you're doing with your PhD? And then maybe we can talk about what's, what's next or, or what's kind of current? Yeah, yeah, so, um, so, uh, yeah, I did my thesis on Nepenthes, which, you know, if you'd seen, seen your, your background, it's ah. like, like a nice, uh, Nepenthes Ruflesiana, maybe. Um, it's whatever but, they have in Palau. I don't, I, uh, I, I'm not a, oh, I'm not a Nepenthes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I trust you. <laughs> That's a very variable speaker. Yeah. 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 It's a tricky one. Yeah, but um, yeah, so I study Nepenthes, this genus of carnivorous pitcher plant, and I'm interested in their interactions with other organisms, both um, insects and microbes. And my, my questions, um, I, I, I kind of have a really broad array of, of questions that uh, use a lot of different uh, perspectives in uh, ecology and evolution, but uh, it all boils down to my interest in understanding how the plants regulate their interactions by the differences in their traits. And I've, in my thesis, I looked both at uh, morphological traits, such as how um, coloration uh, influences, uh, or whether coloration influences prey capture or uh, attracting symbionts which live in the fluid. And yeah, I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in the symbiotic organisms. So the, the insects that don't get digested by, but rather use it as a habitat. And there's microbes in there yeah, that's, as well. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Cause I think most people probably know that pitcher plants are carnivorous, but maybe not everybody knows that pitcher plants have these communities that live inside of them. And, and they include things that are at least commensal, if not mutualists, right? Yeah, so um, the, 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 that actually is the, you know, the, the nature of the relationship, uh, I think, is the, the biggest open question still. Mm. Um, so, so as, yeah, there's, the, so, for, so for, from other groups, there's been a couple of papers that show, um, well, this has been looked at more in the uh, North American pitcher plant, maybe. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Most, yeah, yeah, most of the researchers are closer to the North American pitcher yeah. plant. But in the, the North American pitcher plant, um, we know that the uh, insects can, the, the mosquito larvae can help break down the prey in, in the pitcher and then get nit nitrogen uh, released into the pitcher more quickly. So they can be mutualistic in that sense, mm -hmm. but then other studies, and this one is in Nepenthes, in, in, in fact, um, shows that when the insects, um, when the mosquito larvae uh, metamorphose, um, you know, they're, they're taking nitrogen to their bodies when they, they fly away, they could have gone into the plant. Uh, so yeah. hmm. it, so th there, it's kind of this unclear yeah. line between mutualism and, and parasitism. Uh, oh, it, I think it really is more of a continuum. That, yeah. Huh. Yeah. I mean, so like really broadly, I think a lot of insects that help with kind of biogeochemical cycling as, as decomposers or, at, you know, in, in stream systems, you know, as shredders, a, a lot of the, the sort of general way of saying like, what's the ecosystem function of an insect is like, oh, they, they break things up, uh, you know, like they physically mechanically break break things up into smaller chunks that are more accessible so it's it's really interesting that pitcher plant ecosystem is kind of similar to like a leaf litter decomposition ecosystem for example like on a forest floor in a stream or something yeah but, but yeah there's always that you know is what is what is mutualism really yeah <laughs> you know how how much yeah how much harm can you do and still be a mutualist kind of thing yeah the the, the more that you study it the more you come to the the conclusion 
Um, and my, my advisor said this too, and she she kind of hated it because it's like such a pessimistic <laughs> view. But it's like uh, it. What 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 is the best That's way of put, like parasitism? You know, it's like it's a. Yeah, it's just, I, th- I think Judy Bronstein says that mutualisms are reciprocal exploitation. Sometimes. Yes, yeah, that I was, mean, which is really it's know. kind of a glass half empty sort of way of looking at it. But yeah. especially if you're, you know, figs and fig wasps or you know, yucca yucca moths, like there's there's always a fitness cost to the plant to um, with those insect mutualists. And yeah, it's it, it's a it's not always as happy a picture as you want it as you want to make a mutualism out to be, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do, do you want to talk about the and and there's so you you did some work on on which insects are living where and and then also how the sort of microbial community assembly was working too. Yeah. Like how, what what's the sort of elevator pitch on on the 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 sort of microbes or the unicellular organisms? Yeah. So um so using both um so using both data from the field as well as in um in 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 a greenhouse in terms mm-hmm. of the microbial assembly uh well, these are two different projects but i i guess to um su- sum up both of those in that ge- general like uh to to put it back into the fra- uh framing of the plant's role in regulating the insects so i've i've been looking at um, how fluid properties vary uh both intra and inter specifically such as the the pH levels, so the plants actually control the the pH levels of their fluid, huh. and um, quite um, yeah. One of the it's like really um, interesting and surprising finds from looking at um, their regulation of pH in in this greenhouse study is that even when you manipulate their fluid by adding in um, you know, pH six point five water to start with. Oh, okay. um, you do that with a bunch of different species. Um, at the end of two weeks, you find a massive um, variation in the, the pH levels uh, that you, you measure in, in the pictures resulting hmm. from that after they've had time to um, readjust the pH. And wow. you're from six going down to one in, in the most acidic ones. Yeah. And then there's variation in how... Um, is variation how much variation <laughs> there is so right. um, huh. some species um, have very low and narrow range some have really high and narrow range and then there's a lot that have you know some really low ver- val- values but then some some in the upper uh, levels too mm-hmm. so they're yeah there really does seem to be species differences in in how they're controlling pH levels and then there's also um, the this viscosity of the fluid so some species create a sticky uh, liquid like you would see on um, you know sundew tentacles that kind of oh really like that yeah that sticky as yeah. as the as the like around the rim or like in the actual like the fluid that, that's, the, that's fluid all the liquid wow it's oh, like huh. sticky and then you you take your um you know your plastic pipette to collect a fluid sample and then you'll see this string and i swear that in Whoa. in like some of these like um nepenthes jacqueline it's like it's got these tiny pictures like this i i swear that i was able to get like an unbroken <laughs> string actually like, I, I can't even yeah to that's go hilarious I, I feel like i got like a Whoa. good and I, I guess it makes sense as like you know if you want insects not to escape or something that 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 would be adaptive but it, it do they have insects that live within them like do, do they have mosquitoes that that breed in in their pictures as well yeah that's a good question unfortunately i've i've never gotten to see one of these really viscous species um myself in the field um so the the, the ones that have the really sticky fluid um a lot of the um Sumatran ones are like this. Mm-hmm. I haven't been to Sumatra yet, but um, th- there was one paper that showed that um, th- that a lot of highland, so so high elevation species are, are more likely to have this trait. Huh. Um, and then they interesting 
so that it, it it's it's a lot more um, effective at trapping flying insects. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So most petroplants they're believed to be kind of generalist, but the main prey is really ants. It's ants. Are the dominant um, insect in any Love any those little critters. High street system, pretty much. Yeah. Love them. Um, but ex but except once you get up into the cloud forest, there's a real. Um, there, there is a real downturn in like diversity and abundance of ants once you get in. Mm. So it, that's actually super interesting. I, I wouldn't have even made that connection, but um, oh, yeah. and ma I, I, mammal yeah, people I, love the cloud forest because that's where they stop getting like ants eating all of their rodent food and everything, like when they're trapping and stuff. So that's is super interesting. Yeah, when they switch away from ants. Huh. Yeah, and that, that's, that's where I was, I was going to because um, elevation is this um, large drop in ants. So they're uh, believed to be generalists, cool. but you could think about them as like ant specialists um, mm -hmm. in, in, in the lowland. But um, so ants uh, are, are crawling prey and they're, um, so how they trap the ants uh, more typically is they have waxes on the inside and also very slippery um, lip, uh, mm -hmm. the, the peristome structure. Um, but yeah, so, so ants can just crawl up and then fall yeah. right into the and they definitely can't fly out most of the time because yeah. the wings. Yeah. But then um, flies, uh, it's it, it's more effective if you have that sticky, sticky. fluid at the bottom oh, to keep them super cool. from getting out. So so as you go up the mountain, then you get less ant prey, and then there's more flying insects. So then there's more of an advantage in um, oh. you know, having something to trap. Um, I love that we're talking about ants. This is great. Yeah. Oh man, this is even cooler than I thought it was going to be. Wow. Yeah, and actually, uh, so, so while we're on this, so I was I'd started talking about my greenhouse project with the microbes, but now that I'm talking about the fluid viscosity of, yeah. and, and, and the ants, I may as well talk about. I've also done um, uh, work on an elevational uh, transect, and then that paper just came out last week. Oh, sweet! Congratulations, man. Yeah. Um, but oh, yeah. so 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 that was um looking at community assembly in in nature in, in one species which has mm -hmm. um a, a wide elevational range uh, compared to other nepenthes so there's a lot of micro endemism a lot of these high elevation species it's like you can only find them in one mountaintop but then the species i was looking at is one that you could find from lowlands up to the tops of mountains um and it's not an endemic, so it could be cool. To, I just did one transect. It could be possible to do multiple transects with the species in, in the future. Mm -hmm. But um, the goal was to see, um, you know, if we, um, so yeah, I, I looked at the ants too. But also, so I'll, I'll start with the community, right? So yeah, yeah. looking at the communities inside of the, the pictures in one of these uh, classic um, elevational gradient studies, Mm -hmm. So uh, typically, you know, as you go up the mountain, either you, either you see a mid um, elevational peak in, in diversity, or you um, just see a, a decrease in diversity as, as you get up. Um, but th there's much less data on microbes than there are for plants and animals on this. Yeah. And here we have a community where we have um, insects that are specialized for living in it, as well as microbes. Um, so you can actually do this really nice simultaneous uh, study mm -hmm. of, of both of these uh, taxa in, in one habitat. Because uh, so far we just have, um, I, I think the first one that was out was um, paper by uh, the Fierre group, uh, Noah Fierre's group yeah. in 2008. Uh, they looked at that makes uh, sense. birds and uh, tr trees and uh, soil microbes. But even though the trees are coming out of the ground, um, when you think about it a little bit more, it is questions like, you know, they're, those are such different environments that they're experiencing in the soil versus, you know, be, being a tree or, or being a bird. Yeah. But in the picture, they're all experiencing the same environment. So my question right. was, and I wasn't sure what, what I would see, right, is, um, I mean, first of all, is there any sort of change with elevation um, in the communities as you go up, seeing mm -hmm. as these are all pitcher organisms and they're all being collected from pitchers, maybe the properties in, in the, the pitcher are 
just such that you wouldn't see any sort of elevational gradient. Um, yeah. or, um, or if there is variation in pitcher properties. So this one I didn't know ahead of time, um, but I already knew that there are some species which, which you know, keep a narrow pH level, a uh, narrow range of pH values, and there's others which have a broad range. Um, fortunately for me, this one turned out to be one with like a really big range. Um, but um, in that case, uh, so same as the possible prediction before, um, that you don't see a change with elevation, but you instead see a change based on plant traits. That's that's another way to go. So no no community structuring, community structuring based on plant traits, or is there any community structuring based on the um, external um, environment, which uh, you know the the temperature decreases and um, changes in precipitation structure as you go up this mountain uh, in the Philippines. Uh, yeah, I think I, I said that right. So yeah. Um, I, mean, I don't know if it's technically cloud forest, but yeah, a lot more humid and cool. And I actually mm -hmm. had to wear, um, you know, a sweater in my uh, sleeping bag um, when, wow. <laughs> when I was in the high elevation. But yeah, so what, what do you see? And is it the same with um, all of the organisms that are in the pictures, the bacteria yeah. and the insects? And um, what I found was that... Um, for eukaryotic organisms, so the the insects, but uh, also the algae, um, and, um, and to a lesser extent the fungi, <laughs> they did show um, uh, an effect of elevation. Uh, so um, this was using um, 18s sequencing, so the mm -hmm. meta barcoding approach, and um, uh, with it. It, it's not exactly like a, a drop in OTU richness. However, there is a change in which members of the communities you, you, you see. So there, there yeah. was structuring in that sense, even though I can talk about diversity and what exactly is diversity with OTUs anyway. Yeah. But, yeah, I j just for just for the students to, to orient them. So a, a few other researchers that I've talked to have have talked about sort of this, this approach of um, trying to understand diversity by basically you, you, you use PCR primers to amplify something that you hope is present in a bunch of different types of organisms. And so out of, out of that data, you can sequence all of, all of those amplification results and um, you know, all, all the, the PCR product and and then you can use those those kind of barcodes those gene fragments as as kind of a proxy for diversity and because you're getting sequence data you're getting phylogenetic information as well so you can you can sometimes you know at least roughly classify organisms so it's it's a super duper cool approach to studying organisms that you can't see but might have really cool diversity patterns um but it's it's tricky because you also get things that might be um you know, especially if you're just doing DNA amplification, you sometimes get just spores, you know, that, of yeah. organisms that might not be active in the community. Um, and you also just, there might just be more species than the sequencing technology can pick up. So you might, you might always be super saturated for diversity. So it might, it might be hard to really show like a strong decrease. And so there, there's a lot of tricky methodological considerations to think about, but that, yeah, just to kind of Mm -hmm. orient people there's this this is a really cool way of studying diversity but it's it's tricky to interpret the results sometimes yeah true yeah but then yeah so so the, a, a good thing at least yeah there are you know a lot of outstanding questions like i i mentioned you know there's even questions still with the, the insects and, and their functional roles and yeah microbes have barely been studied but there have been other studies on, on microbes and um even just uh within my lab so I, you know, I was collaborating with uh, another um former lab mate who did her thesis on uh, nepenthes before me so mm -hmm. we have we already have some idea of who should be in there um yeah. in terms of the bacteria and the the fungi but um but yeah so with the community composition um eukaryotes both microbes and uh macrobes uh change with elevation whereas the bacteria it's much less of a, a strong effect of elevation mm -hmm. 
on the other hand, pH is the major determinant Huge structure. Yeah, communities. Um, so I could compare the sort of the relative strength of the external factors and the internal factors for both. So mm. pH well, structured um, eukaryotes as well, but then yeah. the elevation was somewhat stronger. Whereas for the bacteria, uh, pH was much much stronger yeah. factor than elevation, and um, so within this um, this this species of sampling, I had a range of similar to what I saw in the greenhouse study I mentioned before. Uh, so there were some, you know, a few um, that were approaching neutral around 6.5. And then there were actually, probably the majority was actually like 1.5. So it seems oh, to be generally, wow. yeah, pretty acidic species. Pretty acidic. Species. Um, but yeah, and, and then there are some interesting things with um, who you're seeing. So um, this genus Acidicella and Acetobacteraceae have coming up in uh, previous uh, studies in the Pentheus, and I was finding those here too. Hmm. And uh, as you might expect from the name Acidif uh, Acidicella, they're an acidophilic species, um, their relative abundance uh, takes off in the, the more acidic pitchers and then they drop off in the hmm. less acidic ones. That's cool. With, so, so just to quickly back up to your eukaryo, eukarya versus bacteria findings, were you, when, with the bacteria, did, did you play around with different like similarity cutoffs for your OTUs? Because some, sometimes like the, the, like a lot of people just use 97% yeah. similarity, right? And so with that, that's potentially a lot of evolutionary history, right? So I, I wonder, Whereas, whereas with eukarya, um, sometimes the, the, you know, people use different cutoffs depending on what marker they're using or whatever, but um, sometimes you're getting something closer to species with eukarya, but with bacteria, you're getting something more like, I don't know, a, a genus or, yeah. or whatever. Um, so I wonder if that, that could be, I wonder if you might, I don't know, but, but no one uses like 99% cutoff similarity, you, you know, like that, that would, you just be getting garbage at, at that, you know, you'd be getting sequencing errors at that point. So it's, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. Resolution. But um, yeah, so we, we didn't play around with that, but yeah, it could be interesting looking at a, a you know, kind of a finer grain. Uh, yeah. like, say, say um, I feel like, uh, but I suspect that it wouldn't make as much of a difference for, um, composition so so you know doing your you you still plot. see that as the ph results right yeah right. yeah because because we used um the distance metrics we used was um okay. phylogenetically informed mm -hmm. okay so gotcha. so it, right so if you've got um yeah if you've got a lot of similar otus that are different then that's not going to the uh, pull the uh, community similarity in a different direction as much as if you had really disparate um unrelated otus um yeah. but it might it probably it, it probably could change the alpha diversity results so look, looking at the the, the canon index um but yeah um that's cool. I, I, I don't want to cut you off if you're about to say something, but I'd, I'd love to, if you just have a few more minutes, I'd love to hear about like what, what your new project is, or, you know, what your, what your postdoc is, is on. If you, if you have a little bit of time to, to get into that a tiny bit. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I don't want to keep you forever, but you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's fun to hear about what you're up to. Oh, uh, and I, I probably could just keep talking about it. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. You, so you, you know, Susan, uh, so yeah. I, I talked to Susan about Teropis for one of these and, and we, our, our conversation was like an hour and 15 minutes <laughs> <laughs> and it was just it was it was pretty epic because she she likes to talk about bats and it was it's awesome she it's like a ton of information but yeah you're in you're in good company with with these if, but i i will probably cut you off at you know in like 10 15 minutes or something but mm -hmm. if, if you have a little bit of time to talk more that's awesome yeah yeah so so for my uh postdoc um I'm still exploring this question of how um, how plant traits regulate their interactions with microbes. So mm -hmm. the pictures have already seen that pH can can have a really strong effect, and I saw that both in nature in this um, elevational transect 
as well as an experimental setting. And I think I didn't mention that, um, you know, after um, adding the water, letting them adjust it, um, and then sequencing the microbes, we see that, you know, again, there's a very strong effect of pH. Mm -hmm. But then the cool thing about that to me is the fact that it's these physi physiological differences between the species that are, are leading to um, um, species differences in community assembly. So it's really pH that's the driving force, but then pH is regulated by the plant. So then mm -hmm. you you still get that sort of um, effect of um, you know differences between host species. Yeah. Um, so I was uh, really interested in this and for this. Um, Postdoc, so I, um, yeah, so I was, I was really interested in exploring pH in, in Nepenthes more, um, but I guess like, you know, full dis disclosure, I applied to as many different, um, you know, fellowships as I could for the USA one. Yeah, you gotta yeah it was yeah. clear, um, you know, th that I, I couldn't just have it be on, on pictures, right. but what I found through literature search is that it seems that uh, the ability to regulate pH on the leaf surface uh, may not be just limited to pitcher plants or even just to carnivorous plants. And mm -hmm. there's not that much out on this, but it, it, it's, there have been people who studied um, you know, the phyloplane pH, so that's the pH just of, of the leaf surface. And generally, um, most most of the plants that were uh, examined, so, so such as beet, uh, spinach, coffee, um, they actually do acidify water on their surfaces very slightly. Huh. So like a change in like half a pH point or, or something. So bringing it down to 6.5 or so. And is, is there a just so story for why that's adaptive? Yeah, there's no, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I, I get, yeah, I didn't even see any hypotheses for the, the normal acidification pattern, really. Huh, yeah. But then there is uh, an unusual pattern, even you know, just looking at, at crops. And this is um, so the, the plan is to look at both of these extremes now. If the Nepenthes is my acidic extreme. Mm -hmm. um, cotton uh, seems to have the most alkaline uh, phyloplane that, that we huh. know. Of. Um, so in, in those same studies looking at um, beet and such, you put your water droplets on cotton, the pH immediately rises up, up to 10. Just like gets really what? high. Yeah. Wow, that's and wild. Then, huh. Not only that, but then there's one paper that looked across um, different members in Malvasi and we're finding that this is pretty common to that family, whereas that you don't really see that outside of this family. And they have glands which are excreting cations onto the surface and then we don't really huh. know what they're for. Um, but at least with those, there's somewhat of a just so story. So, well, for, for one thing, the reason that um, people cared um, about pH for cotton and, and looked at it more than one time is that the, the high pH, um, messes with a, a, a viral based um, uh, insecticide that they were using. So it, it neutralizes that. Oh, interesting. Um, huh. So then once they found out, oh, cotton has this really alkaline it's, view, we've got- It's to, destroying the insecticide that we're trying to yeah, use. That's so funny. Yeah, so huh. we have to buffer our insecticides or, or use it. Oh, to wow. But you know, at least, the, at least the author that did the comparative study speculated, um, you know, this probably has some sort of effect on the microbes, um, mm -hmm. but no one was looking at that. I yeah. should say these are like from the 80s, 90s, um, didn't mm -hmm. really have the technology to do so. Right. So what um, my project designs to look at is I, I want to, I'm, I want to look both on the plant side and on the, the microbe side. So uh, first part uh, um, is, so, having, I guess uh, as well, both are kind of happening at the same time, but I've planned this experiment where I'm looking at different species which have differences in their pH regulatory abilities on the phyloplane mm -hmm. and looking both uh, at 
caryophyllales, so nepenthes and beet, um, or my extreme acidifier and my um, more typical acidifier mm -hmm. species, and um, malvaceae, which also has variation in, in, in what they do. So most of them uh, alkalinize, but there are also variations within genera where you see some that show the more typical pattern. Um, mm -hmm. So that actually be, ends up being a nicer design because I have two genera, two genera in Malvaceae with uh, an alkaline species and a non-alkaline species. Yeah, oh, cool. And huh. then um, adding droplets like they did in the past, but then you know, doing transcriptomics on the leaf tissue to find out what genes are responsible for the differences in pH regulation. And then doing metatranscriptomics uh, after applying uh, a common microbial community to them to look at how the microbial communities change in response to um, the plant's pH regulation. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, so we, so again, we, um, one of the other research that I talked to, one of the other researchers that I talked to, uh, Dr. Romaro Olivares is, is, is looking at both, you know, sequencing DNA and RNA from like soil communities to see, you know, to get kind of a full picture of like, not just who's there, but what they're doing, you know, kind of genomically. So the, the cool thing mm -hmm. about doing the RNA approach for, for your research is that you're seeing not just what genes are in the plant, but what genes are actually being, you know, transcribed, translated, you know, in the plant. And then also what, what members of the phyllosphere of kind of the, the active bacterial community are actually, you know, what they're doing. You, you can see what the bacteria are kind of, yeah, what they're molecularly doing by looking at the transcriptome instead of just the genome. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's really, wow, that sounds, that sounds really cool. Yeah, um, and it's especially important to look at, um, look at it with the active, um, you know, looking at the RNA in, in this case, because then I'm, I'm looking at a, a short-term changes. So uh, you wouldn't really expect to see any changes in uh, community composition if you're just looking at 16S or say maybe even the, the full genomes. Um, before and after adding um, an acidic treatment. And I, yeah. This has implications for acid rain, right? Like that. Right. Um, yeah. That in, in nature, you know, these plants might have to deal with, um, hmm. you know, uh, sudden acidic inputs. So, yeah, yeah, I want to know, yeah, what does, how is that affecting the communities that are, yeah, uh, surfaces? And might the species which have um, this alkalinizing ability better be able to buffer their leaf communities from, you know, that, that acid rain than, you know, different species? Because then if they can more quickly counteract. Uh, Very OP. cool. Yeah. Huh. That's, that's really, that, yeah, that sounds like a cool project. I never would have made that, you know, I just don't even think of pitcher plants as leaves, really. I just, mm -hmm. I forget that they're homologous with, I just think of them as their own thing. So, so the, the connection of making, uh, you know, studying, you know, the, the leaf mediated regulation of uh, pH is, that's, that's really cool. I wouldn't have thought about that. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, man. Uh, do you have like a, a few more seconds just to talk about why you wanted to start the the Nepenthes thing and like how you fell into them kind of? Because you, sure. you worked on so many different things before that, right? Like you had kind of a winding path towards, uh, you weren't, you didn't just wake up when you were five years old and be like, I want to work on pitcher plants, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it took some, took some doing. Do you want, do you want to just kind of wrap up with, with just the, a little bit of Kadeem story? Yeah, yeah. I also want to point out, I like the imagery of falling into pitcher plant. You fell uh, into, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that very visually in my mind. <laughs> when, when, I, when I made this background, that was, I, that was kind of my, yeah, it was the first thing that occurred to me too. So I'm glad, I'm glad we were able to, to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so I think I... I decided when I was around seven that I wanted to be a scientist. And then when I was around 10 that I wanted to be a biologist. But um, it wasn't always clear to me what I would be studying. And honestly, I didn't think that I would end up uh, studying plants. Um, you know, back when 
I was a kid or even when I was in high school, mm-hmm. I, I kind of had a um, big charismatic fauna in my mind when I, um, I was applying for college for wildlife biology programs. Oh, cool. Yeah. And yeah, ended up um, going to Cornell who did a um, natural resources majors, essential their, their conservation yeah. biology program. But um, the thing was, yeah, I was, I was open to, to, you know, finding an organism I want to study. I already had mm-hmm. in my head, you know, that I'd, I'd gone to grad school and, you know, that I wanted to, this is my passion's life. My life, pa- yeah. life passion is to understand how life works and, and, and you know, and in a natural setting, especially. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, what I found is that I, I would take, I would take different classes on different organisms. Like I, I took botany freshman year, I took a course on fungi. Each, each new taxon that I learned about, and this was also through summer research projects and such that, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I, rather than narrowing things down for me, just widened my interest. Like, oh, yeah, wait, you were just like, oh, wait, fungi are awesome. Oh, wait, yeah. plants are awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> That's really cool. Like, oh, yeah, yeah. not helping me focus. What do I do? At all. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so even even up until the, the point when I was applying for grad programs I wasn't uh, entirely exactly sure um mm-hmm. but I, I kind of knew that I wanted to incorporate both plants and, and animals the, the you know plants are, were really growing on me um, uh. <laughs> but um oddly enough I applied mostly to herpetology programs but um <laughs> For even, for grad school, yeah, huh. even um, yeah, at Harvard where I ended up going, I had initially contacted the herpetologist there. But at the interview, was that was that Lossus or was that yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Jonathan Lossus yeah yeah we we tried some some of the students read the um his recent book on mm. um uh, improbable destinies so I I just want to yeah tie oh, yeah. that in real quick yeah yeah but I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, so Jonathan could mm. tell that I was kind of unsure and that was all over the place and <laughs> my interests. But uh, he 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 offered that I do rotations at, at Harvard, cool. which they don't typically do. Yeah. Um, but then yeah, that was that was an a, a attractive offer. So yeah, I ended up. It wasn't until I started grad school that I fell into pitcher plants and fell into then, pitcher plants yeah <laughs> and the, the reason was because um it was clear once i get on there oh i'm supposed to be in a symbiosis lab i mm. I, I i want to understand the connections between things I, i'm not just um yeah i could stick to one organism but i wasn't looking at the symbiosis labs because in my in my head, all the plant animal interaction work was just on pollinators, uh, right? Agro ecosystems, and then I, I didn't want to do that, so I yeah. didn't know about Nomi's lab um, until mm-hmm. I got there. And and it was a, but yeah, I had this rotation kind of arrangement between Jonathan, Lois, Scott Edwards, and uh, um, Charles Davis. Scott uh, Edwards is a really good bird speciation guy. I actually don't know Charles Davis. I, I don't. Yeah, or Chuck really Davis, I should say. He goes by Chuck. Um, Chuck. But yeah, yeah, he's the, the, the plant guy. Oh, okay, um, gotcha. Yeah, that's why I don't know him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool stuff with Reflesia, actually. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, nice. Also. That's very yeah. cool. But then, yeah, during one conversation with uh, Scott, I think, then I, and like I was talking about, uh, things i'm interested in like oh i'm like having a really hard time just like figuring out what i want to co- commit to mm-hmm. um but I, I think i'd mentioned ant plants and stuff like that and it's like oh wait you've got to talk to know me he said uh, and then that's and awesome that, i'm sorry then i found out pretty quickly oh yeah this is a lab and i already knew i wanted to do southeast asia mm-hmm. so i had that but um so she uh, had can some, i can i just can i just quickly yeah. inquire why um yeah, it's just so. He, I, I mean, I, like I I get it. I yeah. I get it. But yeah, I'm I'm sort of just asking for for the benefit of like how how does this mind how do you how do you make the decision and how, yeah. how do you get latched onto that biogeographic region? So I figure there's like 
two two meccas for tropical biologists the amazon mm. and borneo or southeast asia in general right yeah um and in uh in an undergrad well I, yeah i guess it comes to my interest in, in language as well because then in undergrad mm. um i decided i wanted to learn a new language and i wanted to learn one that wasn't a romance language so i figured like you know i know spanish well enough um that you know i could probably pick up Portuguese anytime, uh, but I want, I want something that'd be useful. So I, yeah. I, I took Indonesian uh, in undergrad so that, you know, to, to, um, so you get the opportunity to check it out. And I did do a research program in um, Indonesian undergrad um, mm. summer after soft, sophomore year, I think, and that really cemented it. I, you know, yeah. I got part of my Bahasa and meet the people as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, I just, I just love everything about just, the region, you know, the, yeah. you know, the wildlife's really cool, but the culture is also really cool as well. Yeah. yeah. So hundred percent. Yeah. And then I found out that there were not really that many people working on there. Like, yeah, you know, a lot of diversity, um, but, but I, it does feel like less intensively studied than the Amazon or, or than the neotropics anyway. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, to Paul Barber, some marine biologist, he was running this program, and it was a marine program. Mm -hmm. And actually, I guess that was the one thing that I didn't get sucked into. I'm, I'm just not a, a, a water person. Not a water person. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So that that didn't stick. But um, but yeah, the Indonesia stuff. But he she actually showed like a bar graph showing like papers coming out of neotropics versus Asian tropics, and then it's like yeah, it's like very or, lopsided. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I figure, you know, I really like the, the region, um, not a lot of people are in there and I have the linguistic skills to, you know, really yeah. break into there. So I had that, and th that was like the one criterion I had ready for my <laughs> grad <laughs> project. Um, like which yeah. anolis lizards live in Indonesia? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, dang it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like when I was talking to God, I was ah. trying to be like, oh, maybe I could do Draco, you know, they're like flying in the <laughs> So cool. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, but it turns out that, you know, like there's, there, there's a, a Draco guy and, you know, yeah yeah <laughs> for sure yeah 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 those, those super cool things might already have some researcher that have already called them yeah yeah and i didn't get into berkeley uh, and this seems like berkeley has claimed to <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah I, guess, um, I guess kansas i feel like they do they do like lizard biogeography out there too sometimes mm -hmm. but yeah oh well but anyway yeah so there was a student working on pit plots already uh mm -hmm. no music so like suggested for my rotation project that I go with her as a field cool. assistant. And then, yeah, then it all clicked. It all made sense, especially when I saw them in the field. It's like, oh, these are magnificent plants. And then yeah. you know, there, there's insects living inside of them. And then I was reading about the frogs that also live inside of them. It's like any, really any taxon just kind of interacts with this. Yeah, person. yeah. So are there, are there frogs that, that use them for, for tadpole and eggs stuff? I, I guess I, yeah, I didn't really know that. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, That's just cool. like Rumeliads in the Neotropics. Yeah. And in fact, I was, I was um, hoping, I was initially thinking of focusing on that interaction, um, mm. like amph amphibian plant interactions, which yeah. was like, really, weird and rare and like the you know still keeping with the herpetology thing um, mm -hmm. but in the, in the symbiosis lab however it was not common enough in, in the field at least where I was going in, in Singapore to um, catch it and yeah, I, you need you need numbers if you, yeah. you want to get your PhD done you gotta gotta work on a system that's actually tractable and uh, yeah I've only I've seen it twice the once on Kinabalu that's cool uh, when I was with uh, Leonora uh, as a first year grad. And then I uh, mm -hmm. actually did see them in the Philippines as well in that yeah. uh, elevational transit study. And um, eight, the 18S frog DNA was was identifiable. It could, could be oh, cool. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so you can get, yeah, you can use the eDNA approach to like surveying for frogs. That's That's really cool. Well, at least if you can see the eggs. If right? you can see the eggs, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, doesn't. Well, I guess if you can't see the eggs, they might not have been there anyway. So yeah, mm -hmm. probably not a lot of. Yeah, it's not not like in a stream or something where you just don't turn over the right rock. You know, it's it's like, 
if they're in the picture, you'll probably see them, right? Yeah. That's cool, man. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I know everyone's like super busy and I, I don't want to keep you forever, but it's, it's been really cool, uh, you know, catching up a little bit and, uh, thanks, thanks so much for, you know, making a little bit of time and talking about all the cool research that you're doing. Yeah. My pleasure. Awesome, man. Yeah. All right. Well, take care. Uh, yeah. Have a good one.